Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher Chris McCann. For more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. And now, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 8 of Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to begin reading in verse 22. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And I'll stop reading there. Um, we have been looking at this, um, this passage, the last couple of studies, and we've seen that Jacob's offering to Esau, his brother, is spiritually picturing the atonement, the Lord Jesus Christ presenting his offering to God, to the law of God, that he he might be appeased that the wrath of god might be pacified and 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 so too here as we've spent time discussing and jacob has divided his company into two groups or two companies and he spent the night with his wives his children who are in the one company and uh, he's still he's still hopeful that the the offering, the present sent before to his brother Esau, Edom, will appease him, and then he'll see his face. And uh, as he he stated at the end of verse twenty, peradventure he will accept of me. Uh, very much the spiritual picture of the hope of the people of God that Christ's sacrifice will be acceptable. For our sins. Now, of course, it is acceptable for the sins of all the elect, but from our perspective of living in the world, it is our hope that we will endure through the judgment and be proven to actually have received that grace and mercy of God to have obtained his salvation uh, for the one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, anyway... Uh, we're going to pick up this account in verse 22. And he rose up that night, that's Jacob, a reference to Jacob, and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. So Jacob, he lodged the, that night in the company. Then we read he rose up that night and and we discussed how the night is referring to judgment day so this is all taking place spiritually in in the day of judgment he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons and passed over the ford jabbok now the word ford um uh, is strong's 4569 and it can also be translated as passage um for example in Judges chapter 12, we read in verses 5 and 6. Uh, actually, I'll start reading in verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. And it was so that when those Ephraimites which were escaped said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? If he said, Nay, then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him, at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites forty and two thousand. And and here 
they're at the River Jordan. There's there's a ford or a passage to cross over, to cross over. And the Gileadites, and, and it's interesting that uh, these Gileadites would be related to what we read in the previous chapter of Genesis, Genesis 31. Remember, that took place um, on Mount Gilead, and, and, and these are Gileadites. So they would identify with with uh, Mount Gilead, and they had had a battle with the children of Ammon, and they did not call the men of Ephraim earlier, and and so out of pride, the Ephraimites are offended, and and they um, they do battle with the Gileadites, and and in this battle they're defeated, and then they're trying to flee across Jordan, but when they come to the passage of Jordan, to the ford of Jordan, the Gileadites were um, positioned so that they had to pass by them, and then they said to the Ephraimites, are you an Ephraimite? And if they said no, then they gave them the test. Say, uh, Shibboleth, Shibboleth. And uh, they could not pronounce it. They could not pronounce it. They mispronounced it, and they said Sibboleth. And then they knew, well, you're an Ephraimite, because apparently uh, it was uh, well known that an Ephraimite could not pronounce um, that word or, or, you know, that syllable at the beginning of that word. And they would slay them. 42,000 Ephraimites were slain for failing that test. You know, of course, there's a spiritual picture crossing over Jordan. And uh, it's necessary to know the language correctly. You can't just be close. You have to have it exactly. You have to pronounce the word properly. And that would identify with... Um, coming to know the language of God, the spiritual language of the Bible. If if somebody doesn't know it, and they and and the natural minded individual really cannot know it, then he will fail the test and be slain, and and that means never cross Jordan and into the land of Canaan, into the promised land. But uh, but here the the word passage is the same Hebrew word as that word ford. Um, and also, in Jeremiah 51, we we find the same word again in Jeremiah 51. And it is in verse 30. I'll, I'll start reading in verse 30 through 33. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They have remained in their holds. Their might hath failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another, to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken at one end, and that the passages are stopped. There is the word again. And the reeds they have burned with fire, and the men of war are affrighted. For thus saith Jehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon, is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her. Yet a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. This is describing the judgment of Babylon. And when verse 32 tells us, and the passages are stopped. That is speaking of the city Babylon, which represents the nations of the world. And it's not being specific as to which passages, but we can really take from what we read in Judges that it it has to do with passing over to the kingdom of God. And if those passages are stopped, then uh, you, you cannot pass over and that means you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And and given everything else in this chapter, the whole context of the wrath of God upon Babylon, that fits very well. So when we go back 
to Genesis 32 and verse 32. And I'll read it again. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford or the passage Jabbok. And Jabbok uh, is a river. It's a river. Um, the next verse, verse 23, says, And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. But but it, it's also translated as river. Uh, and, and we'll see when when we look up Jabbok, we, we want to learn um, about this particular river. So let's read a little bit. Let's go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. And I'll start reading in verse 21. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through thy land. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well, but we will go along by the king's highway until we pass thy borders. And Sihon would not suffer Israel to pass through his border. But Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel into the wilderness. And he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And Israel smote him with the edge of the sword, and possessed his land from Arnon unto Jabbok, even unto the children of Ammon. For the border of the children of Ammon was strong. And also, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 37. Only unto the land of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor unto any place of the river Jabbok, nor unto the cities and the mountains, nor unto whatsoever Jehovah our God forbade us. Now, this is important because when Israel came out of Egypt, God told them um, there were certain lands they were not to possess. They were not to fight with them and and take their land. And And one of those nations was Ammon. The land of Ammon was not to be taken. Likewise, Moab and Edom. And and God would give various reasons for this. But the Israelites were not to take their land. They uh, maybe wanted to pass through certain land. But they they were not commissioned by God to take it as they were the land of Canaan. and. Uh, now, in the previous verse here, in Deuteronomy 2, verse 36, it says, From a rower, which is by the brink of the river of Arnon, and from the city that is by the river, even unto Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. Jehovah our God delivered all unto us, only unto the land of the children of Ammon thou camest not, nor unto any place of the river Jabbok, nor unto the cities and the mountains, nor unto whatsoever Jehovah our God forbade us. Do not cross Jabbok into Ammon to to take their land. And and here Jacob is at the river Jabbok. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, we find another reference in verse 16. And unto the Reubenites and unto the Gadites I gave from Gilead, even unto the river Arnon, half the valley and the border, even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. So we're seeing that uh, again and again, that Jabbok is the river that borders Ammon. It is Ammon's river, just like the Euphrates would identify with Babylon. The river Jabbok identifies with uh, the children of Ammon. And, and the children of Ammon, well, uh, God gives us a spiritual picture of them. And we'll look at that after we look at this one last reference to the river Jabbok. Um, well, for now, maybe we'll, we'll look at another reference later on. But in Joshua chapter 12, verse 2, 
It says Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Aroer, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from half Gilead, even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon. So that that's very solid, very definite. The river Jabbok is the border of the children of Ammon. If you cross the river, if you go over the ford Jabbok, the passage, you will enter into the land of Ammon. And that's what what uh, Jacob's family is doing. They are crossing the river Jabbok and and taking passage into the land of Ammon. Now, um, that's not the same thing as entering into the land of Canaan. It's not the same thing as crossing Jordan into Canaan. This is another cross, and it would represent something different. So we we want to know, well, what is being pictured? What is what is um, being represented by? crossing over into the land of Ammon. And Ammon, uh, we know, came into existence through Lot and his two daughters. If we go back to Genesis chapter 19, Genesis 19, after Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plains' destruction by fire and brimstone from heaven, uh, finally Lot, ends up fleeing to the mountain and and his daughters hatch a plan to have children by their father and yeah it, it's it, it's very possible they thought it, it was like the end and 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 there are no men left but no matter what they thought they were wrong they were wrong and god and and the law of god forbids um sexual relations between close family members and and it very specifically the law forbids that so the daughters of lot in going in to their father getting him drunk lying with him and being with child by their father are doing something contrary to the law of god there's no getting around that it was wrong. It was sin. It was a transgression of the law. That is not the way. That is not pleasing to God. And, you know, for anyone who's been following our study in the book of Genesis, when we went through this, we, we took some time to show how Lot's two daughters are really picturing those in this present day of judgment, it's after the fire and brimstone has fell and Sodom and Gomorrah have been destroyed, they are picturing those that are insisting that God must still save and he must still produce spiritual children. They're they're saying God must continue to uh, bring forth spiritual fruit and and yet there is no legitimate way between Lot and his daughters so they force the issue they they do wrongly and they do produce children and we read in Genesis chapter 19 in verse 36 thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son, and called his name Ben-Ami. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Two sons, Moab and Ammon. And, and they became nations. And, and we'll see as we look at uh, additional scripture that nothing good came of them. Nothing good in, in the sense of the nations that they became. They were enemies to the, the true people of God, to the people of Judah and Israel. Uh, and, and God even says 
concerning them in Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23 in verse 3. It says, An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Jehovah, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of Jehovah forever. And the Lord gives a reason here, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. And so so the law of God says an Ammonite and a Moabite is not to enter in to the congregation of Jehovah unto the tenth generation. And the number ten points to the completeness of what's in view, to the completeness of time forever. Forever. An Ammonite and a Moabite are not to enter into the congregation of Jehovah. And of course... Uh, you know, we, we, uh, always have to read the whole Bible. And when we do, we find that God still saved people of Moab. And if he saved someone of Moab, he would have, he, he could have saved someone of Ammon. He saved Ruth the Moabitess. So there, there's a spiritual picture being declared regarding the Ammonites and Moabites that, uh, doesn't carry over to individual people, that is, somebody who actually was an Ammonite or a Moabite, they potentially could have been saved, and and some were, like Ruth, but still God is using them to represent something very important, and so important that that they typify those that will never become saved. And what it is, is the law, the law, the Ammonites and Moabites are those that are under the curse of the law. And, and because they're under the curse of the law, uh, whether they attempt to keep the law or, or whatever they do, the law will not permit them because no man is justified by the works of the law in the sight of God. And, and therefore anyone who remains an Ammonite or Moabite. Ruth came out of the land of Moab and went to uh, Bethlehem to the house of bread, and she lived as a Jew. But anyone who would remain in Moab, like the other sister-in-law, Orpah, uh, she went back to her people. She cannot enter into the congregation of Jehovah forever because she remains under the law. And the law pronounces the curse of sin because it's impossible to keep the law perfectly in order to enter into the kingdom of God. So both uh, Ammon and Moab would typify those under the law, cursed by the law, and completely incapable of pleasing God and entering into his kingdom because they're under the law. And uh, same thing we saw with Edom when Mount Seir. Remember how God used Mount Seir in several scriptures to identify with Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb, where the law was given. And that's why it's uh, not coincidental that oftentimes we'll, when we're reading the Bible, we'll read um, Ammon and Moab together. Or and and sometimes Ammon, Moab, and um, Edom or Mount Seir will will join forces. Uh, for example, uh, if we go to Second Chronicles twenty, Second Chronicles twenty, and we read, and this is the chapter that's a historical parable teaching us about Judgment Day. And at first, it's the enemies of God that are coming against Judah. We read in Second Chronicles 20, verse 1, It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them other beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. And Jehoshaphat is a type of Christ. 
And then in verse 22, it says, And when they began to sing and to praise Jehovah, set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. They're the, to be uh, announced later. I don't know why God did that back in verse 1. He, he said, and with them other, um, beside the Ammonites and so forth. But here he names them. It's Mount Seir, it is Edom, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten for the children of Ammon. And Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. And it makes sense. Ammon and Moab would, would uh, here be unified. They would come together temporarily because they're brothers. And they stood up against Mount Seir or Edom utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. After destroying Edom, then Ammon and Moab turned against each other until they were all dead men. And we've talked about this a lot. This is the final judgment of the world. It's the division that we see presently in the world where everyone is going after one another. And and maybe at the moment there are some aligned with others like Ammon and Moab. We, we can be sure that once one foe is vanquished, that then those who were who were seemingly together, will begin fighting with one another. And we already see that um, in various ways. But but the point is, it's the children of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir. It is these people under the curse of the law, mankind, and and all unsaved inhabitants of the earth would uh, really be pictured by these three nations. Um, we could also turn over to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25. And read in verse 15. For thus saith Jehovah God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. And, and that would be the word of God judging. Then took I the cup at Jehovah's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom Jehovah had sent me. And then the list is given, starting with Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. And down in verse 21, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon, all listed together. And, uh, and they're here listed with other nations. But in Second Chronicles 20, those three are representing all the nations of the world and all those under the law. And so Ammon typifies those under the law, under the curse of the law. And, and so we wonder, why is Jacob and his family passing over the Ford Jabbok? Thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.